and clinch the division on Thursday. And for more, welcome in CBS Sports MLB writer Matt Snyder. Shohei Otani gives the Dodgers the lead in the fourth inning and then again in the sixth inning in his next A-B. And you saw him in that clip, and I know you watched the game as well, just like myself. How about the emotion from Otani lately? I feel like we're seeing something different from him, Matt. Well, we are, and we heard for years and years with the Angels that he just wanted to make the playoffs, and it's one of the reasons why when the Angels were on the periphery of contention last year in July, heading toward the trade deadline, they kind of went all in and did all they could to try to add to the team because they were just trying to make the playoffs so they could re-sign him. He just wanted to play in the postseason. He's close enough now. He can smell it. He's getting into it. He's really fired up. I think that he's going to have a monster October. Now, he's going to need some help from his teammates. He can't do this all by himself, especially since he's not able to pitch just yet. But he can do an awful lot on his own, almost more than anybody else can in baseball offensively. And it, it was on display tonight. It was not just Otani, but, man, he was a big piece of the puzzle, as always, for the Dodgers. And like you said, it was cool to see they got down early. They came back with him putting him in the lead. Then Fernando Tatis Jr. hits one into the stratosphere with a really cool bat drop, I might add. Uh, and then the, the Dodgers just take the lead right back with Otani getting that big knock. And then they held on. And you can't say enough about Michael Kopech and what he's done for the back end of the Dodgers bullpen there to shut the door in the ninth inning with that big strikeout to close things out. He's been amazing since the to trade deadline. And uh, it, they've made him into a lockdown type reliever at the end of the game. But yeah, th this was basically, this one was again, all about Otani. Well, they're going to need the lockdown relievers, right? Because we, we had heard recently that Dave Roberts was saying, don't rule out the idea that Shohei could pitch in the postseason. Now he's since walked that back saying it's very unlikely that he's recovering and his rehab process is still very much taking place. The fatal flaw for the Dodgers here, Matt, it's not the one for 24 with Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts last year when they got swept in the first round by the Arizona Diamondbacks. It's the front line of the rotation. It's those who's running out there every couple days here in the playoffs. That's the fatal flaw. I mean, what, what, what are they going to do if, if, if you're talking about guys getting banged around every night? Yeah, it's, I think there's still hope for Yamamoto to kind of pitch himself into what he was in the first half before he went down. Jack Flaherty tonight, again, adequate, not great or anything, but ever since they've gotten him, this is just how he's been. Kind of like, hey, he'll get you his five or six innings. He'll give up three runs. He'll keep you in the game as much as they can knock the, round, uh, the ball around the yard. That might be good enough in the playoffs, but after that, it's pretty worrisome. It's I just don't feel like you can trust Walker Bueller at all. You definitely can't trust Bobby Miller. You don't want to trust Landon Knack. Are they going to try to piece together a bullpen game or something like that? That just doesn't feel like the Dodgers, even though we've seen other teams do it in the postseason, like the Diamondbacks last year, making all the way to the World Series. The Rangers kind of piggybacked some guys. Uh, it, it just doesn't feel like this is something that the Dodgers should be doing with the organizational depth that we've grown accustomed to seeing that they've had on the pitching side, but they've just had so many injuries this season. They're going to have to piece it, piece it together in some way, shape, or form. I do think a lot of that is going to be Yamamoto and Flaherty. And then after that, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. It's a, it's a lot of question marks. If the season ended today, which it doesn't end, ends on Sunday, they, of course, have the first round by, but they would play the winner of the Padres and Mets, which would be... A, a, a difficult first round matchup again the Dodgers can clinch the division on Thursday and speaking of the Mets the critical series between the Mets and Braves postponed set to play a doubleheader on Monday Matt how might this impact both clubs especially the pitching staffs uh, first, I want to say it's frustrating. I mean, I wish Rob Manfred would have gotten more in front of this. There's word that he tried to talk to the Braves to move to a neutral site, perhaps in Texas, where we've seen neutral games in Arlington before uh, that building was not being used. They could have played a double header, header there today or tomorrow and gotten that done and said it's going to be Monday. Uh, the Mets actually have a pretty deep rotation at this point. Between Peterson and Manea and Severino, McGill, it looks like Stenger might come back. The Mets can probably withstand that. The Braves, I don't know. I don't know how quickly you can turn Chris Sale around in a series. They might need Sale to win one of those games. Uh, Reynaldo Lopez is hurt right now, as you know. Uh, Schwellenbach, the youngster, Charlie Morton's really old. It's They've been getting good work from the rotation. I feel like this is going to hurt the Mets, or the, the Braves more than the Mets, sorry. It's going to hurt the Braves a lot more than the Mets. Uh, either way, it's a really bad situation for Major League Baseball. You'd like the Monday to be off 
for any playoff teams so they can kind of line the rotations up how they want for Tuesday if they're going to be in the wild card series. And now it looks like they're, they're going to have to play a double header because now they might not play these games if they don't have playoff implications. But I don't know how as close as they are right now, especially with the Diamondbacks being involved. I don't know how we get through Sunday and have these two games not mean something. So it looks like we're going to have a double header and they're both going to mean something. And that is going to kind of mess with the pitching heading into the wild card series. They're going to play a double header, at least scheduled to do so the day before the postseason begins. So basically for the Mets, they're going from Atlanta to Milwaukee, yeah. back to Atlanta, and then they be, could be going to the West Coast to play the Padres in the first round, depending on how everything shakes out. So it's a, it's a yeah. traveling set which those guys live for that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just find a neutral site and play it. I, I'm not sure why we have to make this so complicated sometimes end of the season. Uh, the Yankees are kind of making things complicated. For the second night in a row, they lose to the Orioles, fail to clinch the AL East, only have a half-game lead on the Guardians for the best record in the American League. The top record, of course, as you know, Matt, guarantees home field advantage until the World Series. Yankees play the Orioles Thursday, then wrap up against the Pirates. Guardians host the Astros. Who's going to be the top seed in the American League when all said is done? I'm going to say the Yankees center themselves here. I'm going to say that they go out and get the W with Garrett Cole on Thursday, and then they take care of business in the final series there. And, you know, like the Guardians, Astros, I don't know how much the Astros have to play for there, but the Guardians are going to be setting themselves up as well. Uh, yeah. It's tough. I, I think I'll stick with the Yankees, but we've seen them, right? We've seen them all year be really inconsistent. They go through these funks where it doesn't look like they're ever going to win a game again. And then at the drop of a hat, they just get really hot again. So like I said, I think they're going to get the win Thursday. And I think that propels them into that final series where they go out and, and grab the series and they end up as the number one seed. But I would not be surprised at all if I'm wrong, because I do feel like I said, I think the Guardians probably have a little bit more to play for than the Astros in that final series. And the Guardians are tough, man. Uh, they've been counted out a lot this season. I have counted them out a lot this season. And I guess I kind of just did again when I said the Yankees are going to be the top seed. So, hey. Maybe throw your money on the Guardians. Well, premium matchup on Thursday between the Yankees and Orioles. You got Corbin Burns against Garrett Cole. So uh, uh, that's going to be quite the quite the scene there. And again, when all is said and done here and with baseball, we will have it wrapped up for you right here on CBS Sports HQ. Matt Snyder uh, recapping the night in baseball on Wednesday night. Yankees have won 27 World Series titles. The most titles in the history of the four major North American sports. New York, though, hasn't won the Fall Classic since 2009. Yankees have the third shortest odds to win this year's World Series behind the Dodgers and the Phillies. Coming up, the Yanks look to put the finishing touches on a divisional title. The 9-9 power a comeback, or would the champagne stay on ice? Then we go from the top of the league to the very bottom. Not sure how you celebrate a record number of losses, but maybe we won't find out. Extras on the south side, we got the high Historic baseball record ball up for auction at million dollar price. In 2024, the world of baseball witnessed a remarkable feat as superstar Shohei Otani achieved one of the most improbable records in the sport's history. The Japanese sensation became the first player to hit 50 home runs and steal 50 bases in a single MLB season. The very ball that marked this historic achievement will be auctioned off until October 9th, with an opening bid of $500,000, approximately 2.73 million Brazilian reals. At just 30 years old, Shohei Otani has secured the largest contract in American sports history, moving from the Los Angeles Angels to the Los Angeles Dodgers in a groundbreaking 10-year deal worth $700 million, around 3.8 billion Brazilian reals. On September 19, during his inaugural season with the Dodgers, Otani hit the milestone of 50 home runs and stole 50 bases, leading his team to a stunning 20-4 victory against the Marlins at Lone Depot Park in Miami. Remarkably, the fan who caught the ball turned down a $300,000 offer from the Dodgers, opting instead to negotiate with Golden Auctions. While the starting bid is certainly impressive, it remains to be seen if Otani's record ball can eclipse the $3.05 million, approximately 16.5 million Brazilian reals, paid for the ball that Mark McGuire hit for his 70th home run in 1998. Don't miss this chance to own a piece of baseball history.